This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Rory Carroll, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon, and to Juan San Miguel, who just made a one-time contribution to the show via PayPal. All right, so now let's get to our panel. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 394 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the HBO series His Dark Materials, based on the novels by Philip Pullman, who is our guest back in episode 76. And this will include spoilers for all of season one, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Erin Lindsay, making her 16th appearance on the show. She's the author of the Rose Gallagher series of historical mysteries from Minotaur, the Bloodbound series of epic fantasy novels from Ace, and the Nicholas Lenoir series of paranormal detective novels from Rock, which she writes under the name E.L. Tetensor. Her latest Rose Gallagher mystery, A Golden Grave, is out now. So, Erin, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks for having me. The next up, we've got Sarah Lynn Mishner, also making her 16th appearance on the show. She's a Ravenclaw Trekkie maker feminist who writes at Medium and lives in Connecticut with a Renaissance engineer, a dog, and a bird. So, Sarah, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. And also joining us today is Sam J. Miller, making his seventh appearance on the show. He's the Nebula award-winning author of the novels Blackfish City and The Art of Starving, and his short fiction appears in magazines such as Lightspeed, Nightmare, and Strange Horizons. His new YA novel, Destroy All Monsters, is out now. So, Sam, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Okay, so let's start off with Aaron and have you tell us about what is your history with the His Dark Materials books. Yeah, you know, I was trying to remember when I read them. Um, and I was actually surprised when I looked up online. I was trying to remember when they came out. And they came out later than I remembered. In my memory, it was, you know... Way, way back in the 80s, but of course that's not true. Um, so anyway, long story short, it was a really long time ago that I read the books. Um, and that proved to be good for me because it meant that I was familiar enough with the outline of the story that some of the parts of the show that maybe went over, would have gone over my head otherwise, I did grasp. But I didn't remember enough that I knew what beats were coming next, which was kind of a happy place to be um, watching the adaptation. But I do remember enough about the books that I really liked them, and I loved some of the ideas. Um, the idea of, of demons being the, you know, um, animal manifestation of a human soul that exists outside the body um, was just such a cool one and such a refreshing update to the sort of idea of the familiar um, from sort of witchcraft lore that I just, I really loved that. Uh, it was always one of my favorite aspects of it, but, um, but I also liked... I also like that the, the, the series was not shy with theme um, and maybe even a, a little on the heavy handed side at times. Um, but I, I really like that about it, that it's a really nice combination of sort of whimsical, magical ideas, um, but with some very heavy themes. And also that it straddles that kind of um, difficult line sometimes between trying to figure out, you know, it's categorized here as a, as a young adult book. But it's tricky that way with a with a child protagonist who's just on the cusp of puberty, um, and and I think that the, those sort of more whimsical notes and those darker notes colliding is very appropriate for a book that's pitched at that age of just being on the cusp of puberty. Anyway, that's a long winded <laughs> answer, but that's my that's my history with his dark materials. Uh, how about Sarah? What's your history with the books? Um, well, I had worked at Borders in between like two thousand and two thousand two. Um, and it was a wonderful, probably my favorite job ever, um, because, you know, when you're working at a bookstore, you just sort of absorb information and you absorb, uh, knowledge of books that you'll never have time to read. And it means that you never run out of, you know, suggestions, uh, because you're constantly seeing things or hearing about things or seeing people, uh, you know, ring up the same books multiple times or, you know, having people come to information desk and ask the same questions, that kind of thing. Um, so you end up sort of absorbing. Uh, and I, I remember that 
you know, because I was, I was homeschooled and I was obsessed with, I went through a phase when I was homeschooled where I was obsessed with polar exploration history of the, you know, heroic age. And so I saw this, you know, cover constantly when I was at borders of this little girl, you know, with the, uh, the Northern lights behind her riding a polar bear. And I was like, <laughs> you know, kind of interested. And so that was sort of the original hook. And then of course, when I got into it and I recognized the themes, I was stunned, uh, because I grew up very religious and hated it, um, and very much rebelled against that. And so for me to be able to see those themes in a children's book, you know, and, and it was just a, an extraordinary discovery for me. Yeah, and I want to come back, obviously, to the religious stuff. But so let's get Sam in here, too. So Sam, what is your history with the, the books? You know, I, I love them. I discovered them as an adult, um, probably 2005. So it was probably, uh, Christ, how old was I then? 26. That was so long ago. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it was they were one of the first series that really opened my eyes to how incredible books for young readers could be. Um, even though I had been an avid reader as a young person, um, I didn't, you know, young adult in middle grade uh, wasn't in the same sort of exciting place than it is now. And this was sort of my first clue, um, my first glimpse into how books for young people could be terrifying and uh, brilliant and uh, do so many like really deep philosophical and religious and political things. Um, and so I, you know, I, I loved it a lot. I remember being deeply hurt and betrayed by the original uh, movie adaptation of which I try not to speak. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was very skeptical about this series because I loved the book so much and had been so f dramatically let down by that movie. Um, so say we all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I came to this with a great deal of trepidation and love. Um, and, and uh, yeah, that's my history. Uh, pre, pre HBO's His Dark Materials. It's funny, by a curious coincidence, I also read The Golden Compass in 2005. And the reason I know that is because I, uh, you know, I moved to L.A. and I drove across the country. And so I was driving, you know, 12 or 13 hours a day. And so I was listening to basically an entire audiobook each day. And so I listened to The Golden Compass audiobook, which is great. Uh, it's, you know, the it has all the text of the book, but it, the uh, dialogue is all full cast audio. And it has great, great production values. Uh, and so uh, I think it's, it's literally one of the best audio, like fiction audio books I've ever uh, encountered. Um, and uh, I was actually really, really excited. I'm going to be a bit of a defender of the 2007 movie because I was really <laughs> excited about that. Um, just because as a um, as a hardcore atheist, um, you know, the whole time I was growing up, there was never any um, real discussion of atheism in mass media that wasn't really uh, sarcastic or dismissive or something. And um, around that time, I think the movie came out in 2007. That was sort of the high watermark uh, for public interest in atheism. And there was really a lot going on then. And so I really saw this movie as, you know, and I haven't, I, I'll say I never actually got around to reading the second and third books, but I kind of know from talking to people basically what happens. And I was really looking forward to seeing that happen. Uh, I'm going to try not to go into spoilers, incidentally, about what happens later in the series. Um, you know, it's not a big deal, but uh, well, let's just try to avoid that if we can. Um, but I was just, you know, well, uh, suffice to say, it's sort of anti-religious, right? And <laughs> I was uh, really looking forward to seeing how a mass audience would react to a big blockbuster movie uh, with those sorts of themes. And uh, I actually saw the... I saw sort of an early screening of the movie at the Writers Guild in Hollywood, and the director, Chris Weitz, was there. And uh, I thought the movie was fairly enjoyable. I mean, I, I was just so happy that they were making any kind of like atheist fantasy movie at all. Uh, you know, that just the fact that that even existed seemed uh, so unlikely to me then. Um, and he was kind of talking about how uh, there was a lot of pressure from New Line Studios to tone down the religion stuff. And, you know, they didn't want a kid dying at the end. Um, and so the movie just kind of ends kind of randomly. Um, so that's obviously a, a big issue with it. But he was saying, you know, if this movie does well, then I'll have a lot more leeway in the second and third movies to, um, you know, to be a lot more uh, controversial and true to the books and so on. And um, so I, I found it really crushing that and there was, a, you know, there was a boycott campaign against the movie uh, that really does seem to have kind of killed it you know uh, the movie actually did quite well outside the u.s but did very very poorly in the u.s 
to the extent that New Line Studios went out of business after having just this tremendous <laughs> success with Lord of the Rings um, just a few years previously. Is that uh, why they went out of business? Yeah. I mean, it's, oh. it's the major factor from what I understand. But they, you know, they did that classic thing where you, in the immortal words of Yoda, do or do not. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you, you can't really try to walk this, this half line between, you know, if you, if you're going to take on something that is beloved in no small measure because of those, um, because of those controversial or polarizing themes, you can't pull your punches because then it's just squishy. Then it doesn't appeal to the people who loved it, but it doesn't appease the people who people who didn't. And it's just it seems to me that that ought to have been obvious from the beginning. But that's one of the problems, I guess, when you do anything by committee, is it kind of gets watered down in the end. You know, you have people on either side of the fence, and they don't mean to straddle the middle, but that's just where they end up. Well, no, I 100% agree with you. Obviously, that I I, have, I obviously wanted the like 100% anti-religious movie. I'm just saying that I feel like people are kind of harsh on this movie if you compare it to like the Harry Potter movies or Hunger Games or Twilight or Narnia or whatever. I think it actually compares pretty favorably to or the to Hobbit. Those. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the thing is, it's. I mean, I I think part of it is like because Dave, you're not used to the church constantly interfering with things, um, you know, and you have like it would be as if an adaptation of Harry Potter where they decide not to kill Harry's parents and not to have, you know, basically the wizarding world's idea of a concentration camp. You know what I mean? Like, it would be on that level. Yeah, and that may be. What, Sam, what do you think about that? Where do you come down on this? Yeah, I mean, I think the movie, his problems are numerous. I, I hate to be in the position of, if they'd only killed that kid, everything would have been great. <laughs> Um, but that was like a huge problem with it of like really endemic, like emblematic of the movie's failure to embrace the, the what makes the book so special, which includes its darkness and, and its its willingness to go to horrible places um, in the service of a really great story. So, you know, that is just one of the problems. I personally have a, a hardcore beef with Nicole Kidman and M Mrs. Coulter is one of my favorite uh, book villains, and I thought she was such a uh, a, a dud um, in that part. So that's yeah. a personal thing. But you know, all that yeah. movie had going for it was um, Sam Elliott and Ian McKellen, in my opinion. <laughs> Can I just say though that I don't think that was Nicole Kidman's fault. I think yeah. she could have absolutely crushed it if she'd had a better script. But anyways, that's just <laughs> that's, a, that's just a sidebar. Um, but but I completely agree, and I and I I think you know the interference of the church must have been a huge factor, but I suspect there was more to it than that because it wasn't just on the religion front that they pulled punches. And I think some of it probably goes back to what I was mentioning before about this kind of awkward collision between, is this a child's movie or a child's book or not? Um, because, you know, you have a protagonist who's a child and you've got some, some very whimsical elements, like I said, but some of these heavier themes that you, that you don't, typically see a, and, and certainly a darker approach and a willingness to do, as Sam said, horrible things um, that you don't typically see in a children's movie. And I suspect that some movie executives would have found that awkward um, that you can't, you know, the, the religious elements, notwithstanding that you can't get into some of this darker territory when people are going to be bringing their kids to the theater. Yeah. I guess I'm just curious, you know, Sarah, uh, we know each other through kind of a rationalist group. So I'm just kind of curious if you did you see this movie in the same light as I did as this sort of big opportunity for atheism? Or did you not see it like in the run no, to the I movie? I mean, all I remember, and I think what most people were aware of at the time, um, you know, I think that people who sort of read, actually read movie reviews, especially back then, there wasn't this culture of online fandom. Um, it, it was much smaller. Uh, and so I feel like what, what most people felt was that it was just sort of poorly reviewed. Um, and so it didn't last very long in the theater, but I didn't see it in the theater because I, at the time, um, I, I don't remember why, but, um, anyway, I, I did want to say that I didn't think that, um, Nicole Kidman actually read the books. Like, uh, she has <laughs> gone on record to say that she would never want to be involved in something that was critical of the church because she grew up Catholic and she has very fond memories of growing up Catholic. And, you know, Kidman was, was Pullman's choice 
for the role. He, he was who who he envisioned uh, for the role. And I'm just sort of scratching my head, you know, about why all of this played out. Like maybe he just didn't know, but you know, it, it explains Kidman's performance. Like it was fine. She, she's a very good actress in other things, but I feel like it was very 2D. Like she just kind of got the Cliff Notes version that, you know, she's this sort of ice queen character. Yeah, I mean, actually, to Aaron's point about the the studio interference, I mean, one thing that's really striking is if you watch the trailer for the movie, it has the kid dying, like stuff that's clearly from the kid dying scenes in the trailer, <laughs> which you know, leads me to believe that maybe the the decision to excise that was a really, really last minute decision, or you know that there was a well, lot he did of say. The, the director did say, I think in one of the comic cons, that the studio recut his version and that it was an overall negative experience for him because of that. So I could see how he had finished the film and, you know, the kid dies, the studio swoops in and says, oh, we can't do this, you know, and, and just redoes it for him. Like he literally used the words, the studio recut it. Yeah. yeah. And I can't, can you imagine what a, what a horrible betrayal that would feel like? Yeah. Um, for them to just perform an intercision on your film like that <laughs> oh, and just God. cut out it's of the so soul. So 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 Anyways. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, and you can see how it happens, but speaking of people who didn't read the books, like, what did you guys green light? If, <laughs> if it wasn't this story, then, you know, then what was it? Um, but to, to go back to, maybe, I don't know, Dave, maybe this is a good pivot, but to go back to, to Nicole Kidman and, and the, the lack of, subtlety in that Mrs. Coulter, one of the things that I've been wondering about and makes me want to go back and reread book one is one of the, the real highlights of this new adaptation for me is Mrs. Coulter, how she's written and how she's performed. And I feel like there's maybe more nuance in that than even in the books. Yeah. yeah. There, well, there's I... a lot of meat on those bones and, and a different not necessarily a different portrayal, but just such a, a 3D portrayal of that character that I really appreciated that I don't quite remember from the books. I, I think actually um, it seems to me to be, yeah, much more subtle. Yeah, I reread actually the first one um, because I was on vacation in Canada for the week for Christmas. Um, and so I was actually thinking that part of, part of the reason for that might have been that they did say that they made this series for adults. Um, and I think part of it is with the Mrs. Coulter character is you see a lot more of her, like, abusing her own demon. Um, and you see a lot more of this sort of self-hatred and these incredibly, um, you know, destructive, um, almost suicidal tendencies, you know, of her sort of walking on the ledge and, and her having a scene where somebody walks in on her and she's literally basically, you know, performing the the magical version of cutting where she's uh, actively hurting her demon and sort of, you know, for the for the experience of hurting herself. Yeah, yeah that's a great that's a great point. I was really I was uh, another reason I was skeptical about this show is I had seen Ruth Wilson on Broadway in King Lear as Cordelia and been super disappointed and thought she was really not impressive in a, in a really pivotal role. Um, so then so I wasn't didn't have high hopes for her as Mrs. Coulter, but she's so good. It's such a brilliant performance. Um, it, I, you know, the things you're pointing out are really important and great. Like they do get at the darkness of her really brilliantly, but the performance is incredible. Yeah, I, th I thought Ruth, Ruth Wilson was spectacular in this. And um, I mean, I, you know, the books are I think they're sort of omniscient to the point of view, but they're still mostly focused on Lyra and her point of view. And so, you know, this this has a lot more time or, has, you know, the it, the focus is a bit broader and in, in looking at some of the characters more from, you know, not not from Lyra's point of view. Um, I do before we get too much into this, I do want to just set up the basic premise of the story in case anyone is just listening to this who doesn't know. Um, so basically, this is set in an alternate world where uh, there's this sinister church called the Magisterium that is sort of in some sort of authoritarian, totalitarian uh, posture toward the society. And uh, our, our hero is Lyra Blockwa, uh, sort of uh, almost teenage girl. And she gets uh, this this woman named Mrs. Coulter shows up at the college where she's was raised and kind of adopts her. Um, and um, the master of the college gives her this little golden compass thing called an alethiometer that can somehow be used 
um, to tell it tells the truth. It's sort of somehow some sort of um, prophetic kind of thing. Um, and uh, she eventually discovers that her uncle that she idolizes is actually her father, and he's doing experiments to try to open up portals into other worlds in defiance of the church. And she finds out that Mrs. Coulter is her mother, and uh, both her parents are not great parents. Uh, <laughs> that's sort of the basics. Is there anything else that I should add to the basic plot summary before we... Uh, yeah, demons. Oh, yeah. Actually, Aaron mentioned that earlier. But yeah, so each character in this world has a animal sidekick called a demon who's some sort of uh, external uh, embodiment of their soul. And when you're uh, before puberty, your demon is kind of shifting forms, trying out different animals. And then once you hit puberty, it sort of settles on one that kind of reflects your, uh, your personality or inner character. Uh, anything else, Aaron, that I should mention here? Uh, dust. Uh, yeah. So there's, Seems important. <laughs> this is kind of a complicated story. So yeah, so there's also <laughs> this, uh, this stuff called dust that you need special equipment to see. And uh, it's somehow I, I'm actually since I haven't read the second, maybe I shouldn't even say what it is, even though I'm not actually sure. But but the church believes it to be like sin or original sin or something that clusters around uh, adults, but doesn't cluster around children. And so uh, so Mrs. Coulter, as it turns out, is doing sinister experiments in severing uh, people from their demons, which she and the church hopes will uh, kind of keep them in a state of uh you know, pure of original sin, and then they won't grow up to be uh, wicked adults. Um, all right, so 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 why don't we get into the? It's actually interesting. You know, I think it was uh, actually I forget. I think it was Aaron was saying that this is a, or maybe it was Sarah was saying this is a show for that they made this as a show for adults. And yeah. I actually kind of felt in the first four or five episodes it was a little too YA for me. Um, that I wanted it to be more adult. So I guess I'll throw that out there as our, our first point of discussion. Uh, did you think that this was uh, at the right level of YA versus adult for for you? So, uh, so Sam, what do you think about that? Yeah, to me, this this the show just nailed it on almost every point. There are a few things that I did have problems with, but but in so many ways, especially the the sort of caliber of its storytelling and the way it dished out story per episode was just so strong and so compelling. Um, and, and, you know, I, I thought it, it hit the note just right in terms of how yet why a versus adult it is, because the beginning of the book is so much in Lyra's world and her point of view. Um, so it felt like the right way to set out, you know, um, in, in keeping with the books of like, this is going to go to some really fucked up places. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but for the beginning, we're going to lure you in with something that's a little more, uh, chill and familiar and, and feels like more childlike. Yeah. And I think it's also appropriate from the point of view of, of one of the overall arcs being sort of the loss of innocence of Lyra Balacqua. That you, you start off in this uh, sort of idyllic setting of Jordan College where she's running around with her bestie on roofs and they're just happy all the time. And it's she's got her, you know, dashing polar explorer uncle coming and um, and she's just really very firmly in that childhood space. And, you know, it gets progressively darker as she, you know, more and more truths of, of what's going on around her are revealed. And she herself, you know, is pulled into this mission to save her bestie who gets kidnapped. And, and that sort of descent into a, a more uh, shaded and gray world, I think, makes perfect sense to me in terms of how they approach that. Yeah, Sarah, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think that they were too juvenile at all. I think it, it is an extraordinarily wonderful adaptation, and I had very, very, very few problems with it. Um, I, I just... You know, I feel like, again, Dave, your, your atheist privilege is showing the idea that you would want it to be even more adult is just mind boggling to me. And, you know, keep in mind, like there are people online like that. I'm part of a group, a Facebook group of His Dark Materials fans, and the, the group started with the book. So it wasn't, you know, now that the series has come out, there's a lot of people who are joining the group because of the series and then finding it you know, full of crabby readers. And there are a lot more people than I could have ever imagined who are saying they prefer the film. They prefer, uh, you know, uh, Nicole Kidman to Ruth Wilson. And it's maddening because I can't <laughs> imagine 
how anyone could possibly think that way and it's like you, you you're just sitting there thinking did okay so they all read the books but did they understand it <laughs> and it's it's really hard to not be offensive because you're just like I just I can't relate to that at all. This is it because they love the blonde hair because that she did she got the blonde hair right in in the books she described <laughs> as having blonde hair, but that's pretty much it. Um, so you know I, I wanted to mention that there is you know unfortunately an aspect of toxic fandom to the his dark materials fan base which I actually regret knowing about. I would much have rather just assumed that every all of the readers of the books you would have you know, preferred to understand. stay innocent. Yes, I would have preferred to stay innocent. And, Yet another and, way Facebook know. ruins everything. <laughs> I, it's true. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that anything that's reached a certain level of popularity slash notoriety has a has a, an element of tox, toxicity in it in its fan base somewhere, and yeah. you know, however small and vocal it may be. And I don't know, fan splaining has become such a sport now yeah. that it's just it is it is maddening. <laughs> well, there's there's always going to be this sort of hipster kind of thing. It's like, oh, this isn't as good as the book. Oh, this isn't as good as the old thing, you know. And so, I, yeah. yeah, I just kind of take that for granted. I mean, I'll, I'll say, I mean, I thought this show was great overall, if I haven't made that clear. I mean, and particularly the um, the production, like the the visuals, like I almost can't imagine how the visuals could be better. Uh, I just think that thought they were stunning. Really? So that polar bear fight was so expensive. That's funny. It's <laughs> I just watched it on like CGI budget, CGI budget. <laughs> I actually thought that the special effects were the real weakest link. Like I thought they 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 felt really not so great. And especially with things like, you know, the fact that you – there are so many scenes of people where we don't see any demons. You know, like I, I want this world to be crowded. Because they blew it all demons. on the polar bear fight. I know. I know. Exactly. <laughs> it, felt, it felt like that. Like they had spent the money elsewhere. And so when they were like, you know, this world that we should be seeing like a thing on everybody's shoulder or pocket or – desk or whatever um it just they just sort of show up as afterthoughts um yeah. so I, well let me just well, let me just say i mean I'm, I'm not talking so much about the demons because i always hate cgi animals um but i thought they were I, they didn't bother me too much here but i'm talking more about like the cinematography and the the you know the vistas and the oh i see um, uh, product you know the art design and all the kind of art deco kind of stuff i i just thought like just the way it shot was really beautiful to me yeah. and, and the the egyptians like felt much more real and much more kind of yeah. gritty and everything than in the film um but so but sarah go ahead yeah i mean i i honestly felt like i i've seen a couple of you know sort of articles go by where you know the his dark materials has a demon problem and you know, the, his dark materials need to fix this major problem moving forward. And it's like, it's people who are sort of complaining that there aren't as many demons as there should be, or that the importance of the demons hasn't been explained enough. And I had the opposite experience. I think the portrayal of the demons is powerfully explained. But I think that what, you know, people just sort of assume that it's always about CGI budget. But I think it's pretty clear that it was a, a conscious creative choice, because the biggest conflict in telling this story is not how do you have the money to have animals running around all the time it's how do you make it not look like pets and when you have too many animals running around it just looks a little ridiculous um and it just starts to become very pet like um and so i feel like you know having a few critical scenes re done really well like the um the settling ceremony of the demons uh, of, uh, uh, that they had among the Egyptians was gorgeous. And it was a very gorgeous way of explaining the importance and the sacredness of the demons without having to, you know, just have a bunch of animals perched on people's shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like, you know, even critics missed uh, that they addressed the demons in very different ways in the series, but uh, they met the same ends as the book, even though it's done in a very different way. For me on the, on the sort of the visuals specifically, um, I agree that I don't, I don't feel like the demons were underexplained. There were scenes where I felt that you should see more demons than you do. And I, you know, I understand that that might get visually cluttered, but I also feel like it seems a bit weird that, that there are just no demons in this scene. Um, but I honestly, and, and maybe it isn't a budget thing, but I honestly had the reaction that at some moments I was so impressed with how well the demons were done. And at other moments I was so underwhelmed with how the demons were done. And it really felt like they had certain scenes where they were like, we got to, we got to nail this one. Um, and, and other scenes where they just kind of phoned it in. 
I mean, I think it was at, at least uh, to some extent a budget issue because I listened to an interview with Jack Thorne, who wrote all the he wrote all the episodes, and he was saying just how um, you know how challenging it is as a writer, where you want to write a scene with Yorick Bernison and you're like, oh, but it's costing like I, I forget, you know, ten thousand dollars per second or something, you know, to to do Yorick, and so you're like, well, I can only use Yorick's kind of sparingly. And actually, I saw one thing is some of the producers said that the reason so there's another character who lives on Earth in this story named Will, who, um, you know, it doesn't show up until the second book, but his story is kind of intermixed here. And I saw the producers said one reason they did that was just because um, because of like child labor laws, they couldn't have it be all about Lyra for the whole first season because they just can't film that actress that much. Um, so, like, you know, you start to get a sense of like how maddening it is for, you know, doing television as opposed to writing a novel where it's, you know, anything you can imagine can happen. Like with television, there's yeah. so many compromises that you have to make. This That's is why also why novels. they <laughs> shot all 16 episodes of the first two seasons simultaneously so that they didn't have to worry about her prematurely aging and they could oh, sort wow. of let her uh, go through puberty at, in the same line as the books. Yeah. So try to stop yeah, told- season two now, Christians. <laughs> I, I thought I thought it was actually a really brilliant move because the book shifts gears really radically to be, you know, the b- first book is so focused on Lyra, but then the second book is super focused on Will. So yeah, there's me, a bit of whiplash like a, there. Yeah, to me, it, that felt like the kind of thing you can do in a novel, but that you can't in a series where you suddenly shift so much. So to me, it, it worked as like a way to set up season two, which is going to be book two. Um, so it's not completely like, who is this kid we're following now? Yeah, yeah, people are so much more impatient when they're watching a series. You know, even even readers, I think, that when, they, when they're watching a series and they're not, they'll even say, like, well, it didn't hook me right away, so I stopped watching. And it's like, well, that's because they were slowly, do, you know, doing working on character development. Like, I've heard people, very smart people, talk about the first few episodes of The Expanse that way. And I'm just like, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a feature, not a bug. Okay, well, let's not get into that, because I know Aaron has strong feelings about it. Um, but, but let me say, I mean, I do think that this show starts a little slow. I mean, I thought it was great. I loved it, but I could, it, it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, if people were like, eh, I, I, I've seen like so many YA fantasy kind of movies and TV shows at this point, like, you know, nothing about this is, uh, this isn't standing out enough for me. But for me, the show, like, when, I think it's, I forget, it's maybe episode five or six, when they get to Balvanger, um, the show gets way, way darker, and it really grabs me at that point. And so if you're, you know, if you watch the first couple episodes, and you're like, yeah, I don't know, you're kind of on the fence, I would definitely keep watching till you get to that part and see if it doesn't grab you there. I think that is that at atheist privilege talking again, <laughs> David. <laughs> I think too, um, you know, one of the, one of the difficulties that we have here on this panel is that we've all read the books. So it's hard to know how it hits people who haven't read the books. I kind of personally had mixed feelings about the will storyline. Um, and how it was handled. I understand why they did it that way. Um, and, you know, on balance, it might have been the right choice. But I strongly suspect that if you had no inkling of who this person was, those scenes would really start to get irritating. And I particularly have some quibbles about how the last couple of edit, uh, episodes were edited. There was Agreed. so much cutting back and forth that became it became very fragmented and annoying. Um also, there was a sound issue, but maybe maybe that was just me. Did anyone else have a, like a whooshy sound in the background for the entire series? I was like, is that supposed to be I, dust? I, I didn't know. What is that? that? <laughs> I, I didn't um, notice anything like that. Because you know, I, I, there was something very strange happening there uh, on my on my HBO. But anyway, that's a sidebar. I, I do wonder about. So there were a couple of aspects like that, and one of them was definitely the Will storyline that I that I really do wonder how that landed with people who hadn't read the books. I mean, I don't know the. I did since I didn't read the second. I, I know Will shows up in the second book, but I don't. I didn't really know any of the details of what his story is. So I'm kind of coming to that fresh, and I, I wouldn't say it bugged me really at all. Um, I guess it it does feel sort of disconnected from the rest and of it, the story. It never but... gets to the point. <laughs> yeah, and we know that we know that. Um... I don't remember the character's name, but the guy who's hunting Will um, is connected to Miss Coulter somehow, but that doesn't get brought back. Um, we don't really understand that relationship yeah. super well. What's it, what's he was like a great Lord, character. Lord Doriel or something? Uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh... I just really felt like they they stretched out 
the, the will aspects of this with very little substance um, over over too many episodes here. There was just too much of the same thing happening with Will, which was not much. So, you know, like I said, I do understand why they did it, but I'm not sure it was entirely successful for my tastes. Yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't have a problem with it. I mean, I feel like part of the story and part of, part of the whole, you know, both the series and the, and the books is you have to love the mystery of not knowing or not needing everything explained right away. You have to love asking yourself, well, who are these people? And his mom, is his mom crazy or does she, is there something going on there? And so for me, the, the scenes with Will were so much more about character development of setting who up, setting up who Will is, that it didn't matter that, you know, that you don't actually know yet what the connection is. And you, it's sort of a reward for patient watchers. You know, it's like, okay, well, we know that it, 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 these are tied together somehow. And in the very end, you know, episode where they both sort of enter into separate worlds, um, you know, you, you get a sense of, of what that connection is going to be. You get a sense that they're going to meet. But it, it definitely, I feel like, again, the, the questions are more of a feature than a bug. Yeah. Let me, wait, wait, I, let, I, me, let, me, let me just say, so I looked it up. So the character is Lord Boreal, not Lord Oriel. That would be a completely different character. But... um. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I just I just wanted to respond directly to that. Um, I I'm not talking at all about the mystery elements of it. I completely agree with that. Um, and I always correct on the side of being generally quite a patient viewer because I'm a mystery writer, and so I'm definitely big on narrative patience. It's not so much that I think you can achieve that, but still have a sense of tension and forward momentum that I think was missing from that storyline. So it's not, you know, that, that we need to have the breadcrumbs glowing in the dark. It's that it just, yeah, I th I felt like it treaded water um, emotionally for, for quite a while, personally. See, Sam, you, you, you have some thoughts about the Will storyline? Yeah, I mean, the, the second book is my favorite. I love that character. I love him and his relationship with his mother. Um, I think it's so well done. So I was, you know, I thought this was a really well done version of that. I hear what folks are saying. Um, to me, it worked really well. I thought it was, it yeah. was great casting for both him and his mother. Um, and, and, you know, it is, it is true. It's hard to cut from a polar bear fight to a kid boxing in the high school gym um you know that, that it's never going to come up super favorably but but to me it, it worked it worked just fine and and the lyra storyline is so am amazingly like fraught with peril and monsters and weirdness that this sort of like cutting back and forth w was a good sort of modulator of you know tension between something fast-paced and serious and something more mysterious well let me say about lord boreal because he, and he's sort of the enforcer of the magisterium and he's able to go back and forth between lyra's world and will's world and the scene i liked the least in this i don't know if this is i don't remember if this is from the book or not but um lyra meets this um reporter at a party that mrs coulter is throwing and the reporter tells her basically that mrs coulter is uh running the the gobblers who are kidnapping children and then gets killed by um the reporter then gets killed by uh lord boreal Actually, is Sarah? You said you just read the book, right? Is that in the book that that reporter? Uh, I do seem to remember something like that. Um, now that I'm asked directly, I don't remember that scene one way or the other. But I, I actually, it wasn't clear that that the reporter was killed. I feel like that was more of a metaphor for assault. Didn't he crush death. her like butterfly, and then he crushed it? But it didn't. It didn't evaporate it didn't do the thing that demons do when you die oh, yeah. uh and so and i was actually confused by that because i was waiting to be for that to be resolved like did they kill her or not um but because if you watch that scene the demon does not like she's in excruciating pain and she's been violated and i thought that because the demon didn't didn't turn into dust and because you weren't given any further explanation i thought that that was sort of a metaphor for assault but I, you know, I, at least the way I imagined the, this world when I read it, when I read the book, and granted, this was like 15 years ago, and I barely remember it. But my impression was that the this was not a world with a free press, you know, that, that this was more like, <laughs> you know, the Inquisition or North Korea or something. Um, so just the fact that there was this reporter like risking her life to pump this 12 year old girl for information, which she probably wouldn't have anyway. 
uh, seemed just really odd and out of place to me, but I don't know if... Uh... Well, I think it's analogous to, to the U.S. because you have... I mean, we're talking about a fantasy story where a studio intervened on the with the director's cut to make its own version out of fear for the church. And it's it's not even a direct story about, like, for instance, uh, Catholicism and child abuse. It is a, an analogy. And the church is so incredibly critical of of any kind of of questioning that they can't even handle a a you know a, 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 an analogy a parable of of a similar world like you know so i feel like that that it really does talk about how powerful the church is in our world um that that we would even have that situation i feel compelled to say that i'm not I'm, does anyone know uh, whether the church as such actually said anything about this show or or, or this movie i mean i think there's they it's have. important to to draw a distinction between uh what the voices that come out of the ranks of the faithful some of which will no doubt have the same toxicity that we talked about for for any fandom and and the church as in the Vatican or the church as in the Archbishop of Canterbury, I think it gets, I mean, I just would just, just a note of caution that maybe not all voices are homogenous in terms of how the faithful receive this. Um, and, and I'm using that term as somebody who's not religious at all and therefore doesn't know the right one. So <laughs> if that's not the right term, I don't know what to say, but. Um, well, do you know, I, I thought like the Vatican literally had comments that they didn't like these. Books, I think, you know? I think they did it for for the books. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about, uh, about what sort of organized response was marshaled, uh, to the, to the 2007 film. If you Google it, they, they literally have a response to it. I forget what the exact wording was, but the church did protest it. There was a huge backlash. And since, I mean, the, I remember any mention of it, uh, you know, around the people that raised me and the uh, culture that raised me was very like, oh, those are atheist books. I mean, I had a Carl Sagan book in my room, and my mother made me throw it away. So, I mean, this is the, this is the, 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 the world that you know that I was raised in. It's one of the reasons why uh, these books and, and this series was so powerful for me. Do we know if there was any church response to this to the HBO series? I haven't heard any, which is actually interesting now that you mention it. That, um, but but I feel like this show hasn't gotten a lot of commentary in general like i haven't heard a lot of people talking about it um you know well we live just... in a much more friendly you know world for atheists that we did even 10 years ago especially with the revelations that came out um you know about the uh more recent abuses with the catholic church and the suppression um that you know is almost worse that you know that they knew this was ongoing and they allowed priests to continue to abuse and so on um, so I feel like it's a much more, it's, the world is much more likely to say, you know what, it's okay to, to question these things because the church is, is clearly corrupt. Whereas that wasn't a mainstream, uh, feeling in my view, 10 years ago, even. I found what I was, what I was thinking of when we were talking about this before. I remembered reading about this on the BBC. So, uh, I mean, back in 2004, the Archbishop of Canterbury was like defending Philip Pullman left and right and called the National Theatre adaptation of His Dark Materials a near-miraculous triumph, which is a hilarious turn of phrase. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I just, I don't, I don't think it was as homogenous as all that. Well, no, um, I, I think that's a good point, Aaron. And I, I strong, I don't know, but I strongly suspect that the overwhelming majority of Christians don't have an issue with these books or anything. But um, there definitely were, my, my impression anyway, is that there definitely were representatives of official representatives of the Catholic Church who were, um, you know, bad-mouthing it. Very, I mean, and, and, and regardless of where, where the institution as such struck a position, um, you know, the, the fact is that if viewers, a, a vocal minority or even a vocal majority, if, there, if there's a huge outcry against it um, on behalf of the Christian Church, it doesn't, you know, the effect is the same. So, you know, I, I'm not at all trying to suggest that, that there, there wasn't a, a, a groundswell of, of uh, opprobium coming from, from that quarter because there absolutely was. Um, it's just, uh, I just, you know, want to put that grain of salt in there that it's, you know, a, not, a, not a straight line between Christian equals hates his dark materials. Hmm. 
Well, and it's also very, it, you know, it depends on what part of the world you live in. Like the, there are Christian academics living in Britain who are much more friendly to this kind of thing, whereas, you know, the, the Christians that I grew up around were more of the Trumpian kind, where very few of them had even read the Bible and knew what they were even talking about. But they, whatever they're feeling, they're going to feel it strongly. Um, and so, you know, one of the reasons I think why it's kind of funny to imagine a boycott is that, you know, frankly, a lot of religious people in America don't read and wouldn't have picked up on the allegory and everything, despite how obvious it is in the books. It's so obvious. Um, so it, it is sort of one of these things where they probably, if anything, just drew more attention to it by, you know, the amount of backlash that there was. Well, yeah, and actually, you know, I mentioned in the intro that I interviewed Philip Pullman, and I'm pretty sure, uh, I, you might want to check this, but I'm pretty sure he said that there was no real controversy surrounding the books in the UK, which Aaron's thing about the Archbishop of Canterbury yeah, speaks to. It's not surprising. That it was, you know, it's more of an American not surprising. Well, there was a huge, you know, yeah. backlash of, of Harry Potter here, whereas, you know, that would not have happened uh, in, in the UK. But you have this thing where, oh, it contains witches, you know, or <laughs> that kind of thing. And it's just like, uh, it's it's frustrating. Yeah. All right. So let's get back to the, the HBO show. Um, so, uh, so as I said, like once you get to Ballfanger, um, the series really picked up for me and I thought like going up until the last, um, uh, into the, fin I thought the finale was absolutely spectacular. Um, you know, and I, I, I sort of didn't really remember all the things about dust being original sin and that kind of stuff. So when all that kind of, you know, when all that stuff clicked again for me, uh, as the series was wrapping up or as the season was wrapping up, I was like, wow, this is a really interesting, smart show and really shows what fantasy can do um so i'll just i'll just throw that out there so sam did you feel how did you feel about the the finale in the, the last few episodes it's really interesting because you know i loved i loved the last couple episodes I, I i love the whole show um but i could see it didn't pop the way a season finale pops or at least the way we're accustomed to it so you had things like Mrs. Coulter's confrontation with Thorold and her conf confrontation with Lord Asriel, which, you know, we're used to, you know, people getting killed in a finale. I mean, <laughs> someone gets killed in the finale and it's super harrowing and brilliant and well done. But there were so many moments that didn't opt for the super climactic um, moment that it was it was great. It worked really well. But I also thought it was um, it, it came away without that sort of like game of thrones feeling of like oof i've just been through this like grueling brilliant exciting experience um it's you not it's to not kill more kids right you know you could kill some grown-ups if you're gonna kill a kid kill some grown-ups uh, i'm sure some grown-ups got killed <laughs> but also i thought there were i also thought there were some like I don't know if they were editing errors or or budget concerns, but things like the polar bears fighting the airships, I thought the editing of that scene was really strange. And so I didn't get that the polar bears were um, able to launch artillery assaults on the airships and bring them down. Where was this um, alleged artillery? <laughs> No, it was the exactly. polar bears had, everyone knows polar bears have bazookas. I don't know how, Wha how that could be any more clear. My my husband showed me, like, rewound the clip, like, three times to point out, like, oh, there's something on its back. Oh, it's going up onto a hill. So, like, you can reconstruct <laughs> it. Um, but, but yeah, there were things that didn't feel as, like, well done as I wanted them to be done. But, you know, overall, I thought it was really strong. I was just yeah. saying, I mean, the, 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 when, the, when um, Ezreal opens up the gate, that's kind of one of the things I'm talking about with the vi how the visuals just struck me. I just thought that was awe-inspiring the the light coming down from the sky and uh i don't know that really worked for me but uh, the window so you... the window looked pretty cool too yeah um but uh sarah what did you think of the uh the last few episodes i thought they were great i mean i was weeping mm -hmm. um and so many of those you know the episode where um you know they they find billy um it, which you know obviously was a slight change from the book in terms of what character that was um and the episode of ballvanger and the final episode all of those episodes all three i was weeping um <laughs> even though i knew it was going to happen um uh, so i feel like they were really well done for me and i i also really loved the visual of her walking through this sort of light pyramid um into this other world um I felt like the, you know, the death of her friend was, was just sort of perfect, uh, you know, in terms of just how sad it was. But I, I really, I actually liked the fact that 
you know, I feel like this is sort of the difference between something that the BBC has its hand in and, and, a, and a thoroughly American production, that they don't linger on, you know, on these, the, how sad things are, and they don't bring out the violins, and they don't, you know, sort of belabor the point, um, which I, I actually don't like um, in in other productions. And so it was nice that they kind of had more of a subtle touch here, because it's powerful enough on its own. But they also um, don't pull their punches. Yeah. They do the thing, and then they don't have the melodramatic angst over the thing. Like, they let it sort of Appreciate settle that. on itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. I mean, one of the one of the things that I loved most about the series in general is the treatment of the Egyptians culture, because in the film, it was like they were just sort of six gypsies and they went to the costume shop and they bought the gypsy costume and you put, you put eyeliner on the man and they were just sort of ridiculous. They were just sort of like circus performers. And in the book and in the, in the, in the HBO series, they are so much more the clearly the underclass of this world. They are the poor people. And they are dignified, and they have their own customs, and they have their own ceremonies, and it's beautiful. Like, it's absolutely gorgeous. And so Ma Costa and the actress who played her was heartbreaking, absolutely Amazing. heartbreaking, and perfectly believable um, in that role. And so I really loved, you know, all of that. Um, but, yeah. I think one of the things I had a question about in the finale, um, I don't know if I took my eye off the ball, but... <sighs> And I think this links to, to one of my subconscious frustrations with the Will storyline. How does he find his way to the window? Because it seems to me Agreed. that he just kind yeah. of blunders his way to the window. No, no, and, he follows a cat, which is in the books. Well, does he follow a cat or does he just see a cat in the park? So, Well, he's running away, so he's already looking for a hiding place, right? And then he sees the cat London's go into this little... Place. Yeah, why is, I, I mean, cat, it, why is the cat hiding out by? I'm not saying it's entirely there. unjustifable. I'm just saying if you've got a storyline in which very little happens, leading Will to the window seems like a, a sort of a satisfying way to move things along, rather than have him just kind of blunder into the, exactly the park where this guy comes out of the window. Um, and the cat thing. Like, I, there were a few moments, I don't know, uh, Sam, what you thought, but, like, the cat thing, I feel like there were a couple of moments where it seemed like they were about to set up the cat in the house but didn't quite do it. Was that the same cat as their cat from the house? I don't know. But I agree. Like, I also was really – like, there's all this stuff in the last couple episodes about the father's letters, and I was like, they could have just been a shot of him reading his father's letters. That's all and, it like, needed. Why? And then he'd be like, oh, you know, we could we could have sort of assumed that he followed them to the park. Um, yeah, I also thought that that was really poorly done in a way that felt like a, a editing mistake or something that got cut um, that that they didn't realize left a left a, a confusing note to it. Um, so I think yeah, they're maybe... just trying to be uh, true to the book. Like yeah. in, in the books, he literally stumbles into it, basically falls into the window and has no idea what's happened. I mean, he, he follows a cat in and, you know, the books even say, I think at one point, there's some other character that's like, how, how is it that this boy could have just stumbled into what people have been searching for forever? And, it, and you know, it, it's obviously very much about fate and destiny and that this kid was meant to find it. Um, but yeah, I feel like they were just desperately trying to be, um, you know, adhere to the book. Yeah, I mean, it seems like they could. If they, if he's going to follow anyone to the gate, it should be Lord Boreal, right? If he just, like, that followed him, that makes sense, because Lord Boreal is going to and from that gate all the time. I couldn't remember enough of the details of... for So for some reason, I remember uh, book one much better than I do books two and three, um, even though I obviously read it first. But I couldn't remember exactly how the the relationship between Will and his father, how that all pans out. Um, but I only bring it up because I, I just, there were moments, like I said, in the house where the cat seems to be kind of in a pivotal place or, or almost acting, um, acting like it's got some sentience to it. So I'm thinking, for example, of one of the moments when the goons show up, the cat is acting all weird and yowling outside the door. And I, I wondered, like, is this cat supposed to be not just a cat? Um, and then that's why I wondered, is that that same cat that he sees in the park? Because obviously if he sees his cat, he's going to be like, why is my cat in the park? I'm going to follow this cat. 
you know, and maybe he just follows a random cat. That's fine too. But it just, it felt like there was something there that either I was totally imagining it or it was, and, and this is not something I say often, it was too subtle. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there was something missing there for me at, that I couldn't quite figure out. Yeah, I have to admit I missed the whole cat subplot entirely. So I might have made it up in my head. I, I don't know. <laughs> um. All right. Cool. Let's see. Uh. Yeah. So, so the Will randomly finding the door and the reporter. Oh, I, I'm just going through some of my criticisms here. <laughs> Um, I thought it was also weird that uh, I thought that Lyra was trapped in the apartment and, you know, she couldn't get through the locked elevator. But then when she wants to leave the apartment, she's like, oh, I just climb out the window and go down the fire escape. And I thought that that totally deflated the whole idea that she was trapped in this tower. Um, and it seems like that should have been a lot harder for her to uh, to escape. Uh, I don't know if anyone has it. Do you share that? Well, I feel like that's just the difference between being told you can't leave and being forced to leave. Like if, if you have, if, if you're in an environment where it's almost like, you know, before it's like she wanted to leave, but she, she didn't feel like she was in imminent danger. So it would have been weird for her to go out the window at that, at the early stage. She felt, but does Mrs. she Coulter didn't like know that she about was the in, fire escape. Like, well, I mean, well, she normally, felt like she was, was in prison, but it was more psychological. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's like with any sort of child that you have that like I was raised indoors I was told that I shouldn't leave and I felt a sense of oppression about it, right? Like there wasn't, I wasn't just allowed to wander. Um, and so, but I didn't, it never would have occurred to me to just leave and go against the things that I've been told. So I think that her love and adoration for Mrs. Coulter initially and her desire to please her is it, it, the most imprisoning thing. And she has to get to that point where she's willing to escape the apartment by any means necessary. And also it was at a party where there were a bunch of people. And so, you know, Mrs. Coulter, you know, had to open windows and it, it was like a, a rare moment that Lyra had to escape yeah. that she would not typically have had. So for me, it worked. Mm. Oh, so, okay. So Miss Coulter had to open the windows or otherwise Lyra couldn't have gotten out through the windows. Just go with it, Dave. <laughs> I don't know. Just go I, think with it's, it. I think it's a little from column A, a little from column B. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I really, I mean, this is kind of a random observation, but, um, I, I liked the sort of, um, echo of that scene of, of Lyra being imprisoned in the apartment when she imprisons Mrs. Coulter, um, at Bolvangar at, at the facility. And the scene of the two of them screaming at each other through the oh. door was so well done. Oh, yeah. I was like, it's just so brilliant just showing yeah. like how similar they are. Yeah. Um, and just how full of white hot rage. Very well done. What does everyone think about the Yorick Burnison storyline? Um, I have to say, like the, I mean, um, when I, my my memory of the book is that that was the part I had the biggest issue with was the whole thing where Lyra convinces Yofer uh, that she's Yorick's um, demon. Uh, that was the thing that stood out to me from the books. Is like, eh, I don't know if I really buy this. Um, Especially so, since they went to such trouble to say you can't trick a bear. And then they're like, but here's the dumbest, most gullible bear ever. To to me, it worked because he, he wants so badly to be human. You know, it's like he has this sort of like identity crisis where he essentially isn't a bear. He's so desperate to be human that he believes things that he, you know, are stupid. He's King Louie <laughs> um, from the Jungle Book. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it worked. I thought it was a great, you know, a great example both of her skill as a as a liar but also like um him as a character and and, and sort of like a a, a self-hating bear uh thing overall i really loved all the yorick stuff although i the polar bear special effects for me were the weakest link special effects wise oh really yeah i thought the polar bear fight like the the one-on-one -on -one polar bear fight the way the fur moved and everything like that was just i thought it was super well done yeah, I think it was a really good decision to remove the armor yeah. for the fight. Like, I get that people are upset because they're like, <laughs> the armor's supposed to be a soul and all of that. But I, I really do think that they made that decision because it would make a much better, more believable, more sort of raw looking fight. Yeah, I thought the polar bears in this were a lot, seemed a lot more like wild animals than in the feature film version, which I thought, you know, played really well. Yeah, I love the I love the polar bear fight. I thought it was brilliant, but then 
there's like the at the real. I'm not saying I wanted to see a polar bear's jaw get torn out, but at the pivotal moment, <laughs> the fact that they they the fact that they cut to Lyra for a really long time. At first, I was like, oh, that's a brilliant move. But then it went on for so long that I was like, oh, that's a special effects budget move. <laughs> so like it was it was good. It just went on for too long to the point where it dulled the impact of that really powerful scene. I felt like they were trying and not entirely succeeding to make you wonder who won the battle. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you're I seeing think. it all from Lyra's perspective, and you're terrified for her because she is terrified that what has she done? She she feels tremendous guilt over setting this situation up. So I do think that you know it was sort of again a little from column A, a little from column B. Like yes, it's going to be really expensive to do this otherwise, but hey, if we do it from Lyra's perspective, it's both really moving and tense and resolves that problem. Okay, so so for people who don't know, so in the feature film, uh, during the, the climax of the bear fight, is that Yorick like just wax Yofer's jaw off and the jaw comes flying to, flying into the camera. And when I saw that at the this advanced screening, the whole audience is like cheering at that part. So that's um you know, when I think about when people are like, Oh, is it good? I'm like, Oh my god, there's this bear jaw flies into the camera. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but the thing with with I I I, I mean I like the idea that you, um that Lyra lies to uh, Yofer and and I, I get what Sam's saying about that he's the self hating bear who wants to be a human and everything but just the fact when she's like I can show you my demon power but I have to go behind the column over there to do it like how do you not realize that you're being tricked somehow you know like I I just I just think like that needed to be and I know it's like the book but I I think I feel I just feel like I, he needs to not seem so dumb um in in that sequence it's just but it's a classic children's book scene isn't it um yeah and and maybe a little bit too much so that at that stage um of the you know maybe that scene wouldn't have stuck out so much earlier in the narrative when we're still sort of shifting from the more whimsical childlike um atmosphere to to the darker atmosphere that we get to later um, it did feel, that one feels very much like the sort of thing that would not be out of place in any standard fairy tale or, you know, right. it, 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 so it, it belongs in the Rowling Hobbit. To... It, it feels very Hobbit to me. It's like, it, it belongs yeah. in the Hobbit, but it ended up in Lord of the Rings. Oopsie. Um, and that's sort of how it, how it came off, I think. But that being said, I didn't, I didn't find it a huge flaw and it's, it's hard to take a show to task for, rendering something that you know is important in the books um as long as they're reasonably faithful about it but can we talk about lee scoresby for a second sure. what did what did everybody think about lee scoresby um yeah i, I you know I, I i was really excited that lynn manuel miranda was in this love hamilton um i didn't love him in this i mean he he's very charismatic but he felt a little out of place or something or like tentative he felt tentative to me like like he was a demon that hadn't really settled i wasn't there he just kind of didn't seem to inhabit the role to me like he didn't quite sink in somehow um in terms of what kind of Lee Scoresby he was going to be. I was looking for a kind of a Han Solo vibe. Definitely didn't get that. There was just something off about it. I can't quite put my finger on. I mean, I'm probably the only person on the planet who is not a Lin-Manuel Miranda fan. Um, I just feel like there's something so Broadway about his performance style. Yeah. And that to me was that what was what compromised this character was that it just, it never to me felt sincere. It felt like I'm, I'm acting um, for like in a different mode than the rest of the show. Um, and I'm performing a different way. So to me, it didn't feel like a, the sort of like, it, it felt neither like a fairy tale nor a gritty, bloody, um, HBO show. It, it felt like a Broadway performance that, that felt really out of place for me. Yeah. I, I, I just feel bad criticizing the guy, but I just, it, it didn't quite click. Especially because he's such a big fantasy fan, and I'm sure he loves his dark materials and was so excited to do this and everything, but. Yeah, it it didn't bother me. I mean, I I'm it's one of those things where there are a lot of otherwise disjointed things in the series in general. 
there is an American that randomly shows up and you're like, well, why is this American here? Why is this random Texan hanging out in this, in this universe in Britain, you know, in a big balloon? And there's so many elements, you know, that, that come in and, and it's, it draws you back to the fact that this is originally meant for children. And, you know, it, 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 it but to me, it, it didn't feel unsuccessful. Like it, you still love the character. Like you still, feel like he sort of is partly there for comic relief he you know he a, a lot of those scenes between him and lyra they played off each other really well and you can see the you know the the developing relationship and in the end when he is talking to the witch and you know recognizes that he kind of has to put the han solo thing behind so that he can love and care for this this girl and take care of her and not just be money driven um so you know it, it worked for me but i don't really have any you know explanations why why i think it didn't for some well and it, it just yeah because I, I feel like a lot of my issues with this are this sort of tension between some of it is so 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 for kids and some of it is so 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 for adults and i feel like more than anything else that comes to mind just offhand that's that's true of historic materials is that you know it's not a, it's not operating at the same register throughout it's this very distinctive mix of those two things yeah which is true of the books as well yeah no yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah yeah, and I, I mean, ninety nine percent of this show I just loved and thought that that balance was so brilliantly portrayed, and that's what makes the book so special. And and I and I and I, you know, the fact that it's like horrifying and terrifying and grim, like the the interior of um, Svalbard when she's going to talk to um, Yofer, and it's just there's like whale carcasses and it's bloody and horrible. I just thought it was so grim and brilliant, and so to to inhabit both worlds so well of like the kid the kid fairy tale and the grown up bloody floor was I, I loved it. And uh, they did such a good job on the casting overall. Um, there were, you know, a couple that, that we have quibbles with maybe, but, um, but overall I thought the casting was, was amazing. And like Roger, they cast this kid who just basically looks like Thumper from Bambi. <laughs> he could not look more innocent and he's going to get picked up by his ears at some point and it's going to be awful. And you see, you know, the doe eyes and just the round cheeks and the whole thing. And then, and then Lyra, they resist the urge to, to cast some very sort of, Disney sweet faced thing and, and they, and they cast Daphne Keene, who's amazing and, and who brings her own darkness to the role. Maybe just cause I remember her from Logan, but you know, just that, that's not sort of a casting that would have occurred to me, but is in fact perfect. Yeah. Yeah. She's mind blowing. She's absolutely mind blowing. I can't imagine why anyone would prefer, you know, the, the child actress in the, the golden compass. And some people do, of course, these weird fan groups. Um, you know, and, and a lot of that has to do with hair color for some reason. Um, because <laughs> the, 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 the physical is descriptions better. in the book have, have very nothing to do with the characterizations. It's just, it's very odd. But yes, I mean, Daphne Keene is just on a whole other level where several times when I was watching her, I'm just, I, I turned to my partner and I'm like, how is it that she has the maturity to understand the depth of all of, uh, of what the character is going through in all of this as a child? It's just, it's mind blowing. It's amazing. She's so perfect. I mean, I, I will say, Sarah, I mean, I, well, first of all, I thought Roger, I think that kid is an amazing actor. Like, yeah. I, I was blown away by him. And I, I liked Lyra a lot. I think she's also an amazing actor. I will say like the one thing that I think, or one thing that I think that, um, Dakota Blue Richards, one thing I'll say for her is I thought that like, I believed her a little bit more as a like mischievous bullshitter kind of person. Whereas like, I felt like, you know, um, Lyra always looks Daphne, like she's going to stab you in the face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like Daphne Keene, like, um, it was in the plot that she's like makes up stories and is lying all the time, but like, it, it seemed like somehow not, um, embodied as much in her personality. Um, but I mean, like just in terms of acting talent, I think that she's phenomenal, but, um, yeah, and I, I thought, I thought it works super well, especially because of how much like Mrs. Coulter she is yeah. like, they're both super smart and angry and they'll stab you, you know, maybe with a knife, but maybe with like a policy <laughs> decision, like it'll, uh, yeah, to me it works super well. Yeah. You stole the, the thought out of my head, Sam, that like some of that, Dave, I think is direction. <laughs> 
um, yeah. because it was so clear to me that they were trying to emphasize that duality. Um, and that silver tongue aspect you see in a lot of Mrs. Coulter's behavior as well, where oh, she yeah. she's backed into a corner um, and it's a corner she can't fight her way out of. And so she, she gets, you know, she, she breaks out the silver tongue and she talks her way out of a jam again and again. And you can sort of see how that is potentially Lyra's future. So it's less like mischievous and more sociopathic kind of. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yep. Here for yeah, And it. I feel like, you know, <laughs> Richards did a fine job, but it was just sort of like she had been handed the, okay, you're supposed to be a feisty character. You know, you're supposed to be a feisty little girl thing. Um, just like uh, Nicole Kidman had been handed the whole, you're supposed to be, you know, this sort of ice queen. Um, so I feel like there just was there, the performances were more caricatures of the characters in the book, whereas the series, you feel like they're real. You just feel like they're real people. Yeah. And again, in some cases, maybe more real than the books. Like, and to go back to Nicole Kidman, I, my overriding impression, and again, this has sort of been smoothed over by many, many years since I read the book, but my overriding impression of Mrs. Coulter from the books is unfathomable, inscrutable ice queen. And Nicole Kidman sure gave us that. Um, and, but that's not nearly as interesting a Mrs. Coulter as what we get in this show, which is far, far more interesting and far more believable. Like, you almost you're on the on the cusp of of sympathizing with her at certain moments, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, well, there's this moment. I think it's after her monkey like strangles um, pencil Iman, but then she's like, "Give me a hug," or maybe I don't. Know if, uh, maybe it's not that. But there's there's a moment where Lyra hugs her, and the camera lingers on Mrs. Coulter's face, and she makes this kind of like almost like perplexed expression, like she's feeling affection for the first time or something, and. There, there are, um, you know, like moments like that where, yeah, I, I, she is a really interestingly um, ambiguous or, you know, sort of morally ambiguous character. Um, and she's and she's also a troublingly believable portrayal of the the abuser in an abusive relationship yeah. where she she's, uh, you know, got this duality to her where she just ha and, and you have whiplash as a viewer and 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 as as Lyra, where at one moment she's, she's being physically violent and screaming. And the next moment she's cuddling and she's sorry, and she really loves you. And she means both of those things ex at the same time. And it's just, it's horrible to watch and also very believable. Yeah. In the books, I remember being very much like team Lord Asriel. And she's like this amazing villain who we love to hate and fear and only only very later sort of comes to have a, a redemption and a and a and a, um, a an evolution as a character in terms of the way that we and Lyra see her. But in this, I almost felt the opposite. I almost felt like um, Lord Asriel was always a jerk. She was the one who made much more sense. Like her actions were much more understandable. Um, and like you know, like just to limit it to what's in the show, like Lyra, like Mrs. Coulter says, like I would never hurt someone you love. Um, but Lord Asriel has no problem hurting someone that Lyra loves, you know, like for, to me, it was a really great job of making her as a villain, much, much richer and more complex and more identifiable while still maintaining like full villain mode. I mean, is that, is that an issue though, Sam, for Lord Asriel that you're kind of like, why does Lyra yes. idolize him so much? Yes. Yeah, but I get it. I mean, I get why you why you idolize the absent father, the the, the one who's not there, the one who's um, off doing heroic things. Which you know, heroism in my mind is usually synonymous with you know problematic behavior. But well, and, uh, and it's part yeah. of the reason why the betrayal and and the loss of innocence is so heartbreaking at the end because it isn't just that she's you know getting a sense that there are bad people in the world. It's that. She loved Lord Asriel, and she would have been so proud to find out that, you know, he was her father and everything, and she trusted him. And it never even occurred to her to, like, ask the alethiometer, what are Lord Asriel's <laughs> names? Can I trust him? That yep. kind of thing. Because she trusted him so automatically, even though he clearly had no interest in her. And that, you know, is in the books also, and it's, it's heartbreaking because you know that she wants it so much. And, you know, it, they do a wonderful job, I think, of showing at the end, I think, um, when Mrs. Coulter and 
Lord Asriel are talking, and she says, oh, I want her so badly. I want her more than anything. And Lord Asriel's like, really? Why? He's like, man, it's <laughs> just, it's harsh. It is so harsh. But it's part of yeah. why, you know, she loses this sense where she feels so, so responsible for Roger's death because she trusted Lord Asriel. But Dave, what? can I go back to your question that wait, you asked wait, a I... second ago? Yeah, wait, let me just say something first, and then we'll go to you. But um, yeah, I, I just feel like there should have been, I don't remember any scene, because I feel like Lord Asriel, there should have been this sort of like deadbeat dad who rolls into town and like takes you out for ice cream and stuff. And like, he just seems like he doesn't, isn't interested in her really at all. And I, I feel like there should have been like, a little bit more of a like, oh, he's, he can be charming toward her when he wants to be. And, and we understand why she uh, has all this affection for him. That's exactly what I was going to say is that I, I think the one thing that was perhaps less successful than it could have been was the setup, the initial setup of Lord Asriel, because that's why it's so heartbreaking that portrayal in the end. Um, and I think they did a good job of establishing the, the fact of Lyra's feelings and, and how she had this uh, idolization of her uncle slash father. But I think they were a little bit less successful than the book in that very first episode um, and t to some degree, the second episode of having him be this mysterious, but dashing and sophisticated, like that kind of shine. We never see that shine. We know that she sees that shine, but I, I don't know that we as a viewer get that, that luster right at the beginning where, where I think we needed to be bowled over by him a little bit more than we were in order for that betrayal to land quite as devastatingly as it could have. I felt like it was there for me, and you get hints of it, which I appreciated, that they didn't set him up in the beginning as a hero, because you have uh, Roger running, and one of my favorite scenes in the series is Roger runs up to the airship and kind of gets in, in Lord Asriel's face and says, you don't know how special she is. And I mean, I remember like I, a tear came to my eye at that point because I was like, oh, Roger, <laughs> you know, like, you know what's coming for Roger. But I, I, I actually love that because it's one of the things in the film that I didn't like is in the beginning, you know, Daniel Craig was just being James Bond. I'm sorry. Like Daniel Craig is a fine actor, but in it as Lord Asriel in the beginning, he's indistinguishable from James Bond. Um, and so for me, the, the, the introduction of James McAvoy was much more true to the character. Yeah, I mean, I, I liked James McAvoy's uh, performance a lot. Um, and I, I thought he was very, very compelling. I, I just I think I literally just needed one scene where he's charming. Totally with Lyra. you. And he can't. And the thing is, he can be like James McAvoy can charm your socks off. Um, and I just, I just thought one little bit more, I think would have, would have done it, but it's a quibble. Like overall, I definitely really personally, I really liked his portrayal of Asriel overall. I just thought we needed a little bit more time with him at the beginning. And if for no other reason, just to connect with him a little bit more, because he's of course absent for the overwhelming majority of the screen time. So, um, and again, that's true to the books and it's, and it's important, but I just felt like the hook didn't quite sink enough right at the beginning for it to tear all the flesh when it got yanked out at the end. I just <laughs> he's, he's, developed that as I was speaking and it's gross. Sorry. <laughs> he's not, it works. he's not Marissa. He's not, he's not Mrs. Coulter though. His power is not as in, in his manipulation. It's in his coldness and his indifference. So it, you know, he never would have any reason to be charming toward Lyra because he literally regards her as worthless. He, he does so in the books as well. I mean, there's a couple of moments where he cares for her physical safety that she lives, but that's it. He, he doesn't praise her at all for what she's done. He doesn't acknowledge what she's done. And in the books, this is repeated over and over again, where he just kind of asks, well, he, she isn't special. She's, she's not even very smart. And even, uh, her mother is like, what? Are you paying attention? Have you seen what she's done so far? I would argue that he doesn't need to be charming toward her. He just needs to be, he can, he can be as indifferent as, as he needs to be and still be a little bit more, um, you know, dashing and, and, and but somehow that, inscrutable at any anyway. Well, that, that's an interesting observation, Sarah. I, I actually like that a lot. And you, when you consider especially that his demon is a feline and felines <laughs> are sort of standoffish and you know, don't often don't, you know, you make haven't any met to mine. Charm you. <laughs> You'll be hearing uh, all about her when you hear this recording, though, which is why I keep <laughs> muting my mic. <laughs> uh, no, no. But no, but I, I like that idea that, you know, a lot of times like you like or like kind of like what draws you to someone, I guess, is the fact that they don't make any effort to charm you. And, you know, and and, and that's why I like cats is because you just like hug them and they're like, no, let me go. Um, 
but yeah, I don't know. So I, I guess I can, I guess I can see that, but, um, I don't know, Sam, uh, do you have any, any, any other th thoughts on this? No, I mean, I, I hear what folks are saying. Um, you know, it does to, to me, like if anything, I wanted a little bit more sense of who he was, not necessarily what that, like, I didn't need it to be. He's charming. Um, but you know, something of like, we know he's a heroic figure. Um, we don't know what his achievements are. We don't like have pictures of him in magazines or maybe we do. And I missed it. Um, <laughs> just a little more background on him might have been helpful, but, um, you know, to me, it wasn't a major, a major, major flaw. He's never been the sort of like a thing that, that, that I love super much about this series. Let me just say too, I mean, I, I, I mentioned I listened to some interviews with the writer of this, Jack Thorne, and I don't remember how explicit this is in the books, but he was saying that the theme to him is that it's more important to be good than to be great, and that Mrs. Coulter and Lord Asriel both want to be great. Like, you know, um, Mrs. Coulter wants to solve the problem of original sin, basically, and Lord Asriel also has grand overarching ambitions and that Lyra just wants to be nice to her friends. And I thought that was a really interesting observation and really, um, you know, I, I feel like a lot of Sam was saying earlier about how Facebook ruins everything. I feel, I feel like a lot of people just want to save the world uh, on social media and stuff and just being nice to people might actually just be a better way to go through life and not worrying so well, much it's about one of the things that, um, that I appreciate about Pullman is that he's not at any point saying, you know, he's not like, well, the person who's interested in, in science is the good guy and the person who's interested in religion is the bad guy. Like the mother represents religion and the father represents science, but they both betray Lyra and they both do it for selfish reasons. And I think that that's a, a wonderful binary that he sets up in the, in the beginning, um, you know, that, that both of these characters betray her. And, you know, both in, in much the same way, but they are driven by very specific. Well, but I, I would say in a way, in a weird way, it's not selfish reasons. It's idealistic reasons. It's just, an, you know, well, putting, but, an, putting an ideology above human concerns. Right. I mean, the, the desire to save the world at the cost of, of killing people is, you know, for the glory of saving the world is, you know, I mean, that that kind of idealism is destructive. And, and, and I think that that's partly why you have, because everybody in the church believes that that's the thing. Like there are literally people in, in, in the church who believe that it's okay that women die if zygotes get to live that kind of thing. Also, I think that Mrs. Coulter, especially, um, there's some trauma that she's coming from that scene where she's sort of explaining to Lyra about why she has to cut people's daemons off. The acting was so phenomenal that it got across that like, what is, what is her pain? Like what happened to her when she hit puberty or when she was an adolescent that was super damaging and that sort of like set her on this path to want to save others from this same from something that happened to her. So to me, it was like, if not selfish in the sense of like, I want to save the world because I'm super awesome and I want to get my picture on magazines. It was like, I am working out personal difficulties at the expense of other people. And, and that's not true idealism, is it? And, and I think one of the things they did very well was showing that fundamentally, although both Azriel and especially Mrs. Coulter are ostensibly working toward these great moral aims, or philosophical aims. In fact, it's all about them. It's just extreme narcissism from the beginning. And, yeah. and I didn't buy Mrs. Coulter's, uh, um, ideology in particular. I got the impression that it was more like whatever Asriel is doing, I'm going to do the opposite hmm. and I'm going to be greater than him and, and, and kind of done in opposition and conflict, all of which is very believable to me. Um, and, and a lot of people who achieve great things do so for fundamentally selfish reasons. But I didn't buy that it was ideological per se. Um, that was certainly the gloss that they gave it in order to justify their actions. Um, the ends justify the means, blah, blah, blah. But really, when it came right down to it, it's just two ruthless people with unbridled ambition doing whatever it takes to be great. Well, and they also show that she hates or she, she loves watching the, the separation. They they describe it as remember the joy that she takes that she took watching the first severance or whatever it was or however they phrased it, but that Mrs. Coulter derives pleasure 
from watching this suffering occurring in in you know in children that she views as disposable i mean we also know from her backstory if i have it have it straight that you know she sort of fell socially from her relationship with lord asriel and so it's sort of this um evasion of her own personal responsibility to uh sort of blame the demons for for everything um and he wrecked her and so now she wants to wreck him except that deep down she's still completely obsessed with him so when she has her moment at the end their their demons are all lovey-dovey oh my god that that was brilliant yeah <laughs> Did the monkey ever speak? I can't remember hearing the monkey no. speak. No. No, Is no, there something she... there? Is that a thing? I think that's related to her her sort of self-flagellation um, and the abuses that she has endured with with the monkey and with, you know, abusing herself. I, I honestly think that, that that comes from that. Yeah, because hers is the only one that doesn't speak, and also it can go farther from her than apparently anyone else's except witches, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought that was brilliant because it was like, you know, for, for Lyra, for most people who have daemons, their daemon is like someone who talks to them and is their better self and gives them counsel and says, don't do this stupid thing. And so the fact that hers never speaks and that she has no one to sort of like whisper in her ear, maybe you shouldn't do this horrible thing, um, was brilliant. I remember that being in the books that the monkey didn't speak, but I could be wrong. I, I haven't read I, it. So I remember that as well. Yeah. And and they made it like I made a, made a point of saying that the the monkey doesn't speak, or just that you don't remember the monkey speaking. I don't remember the monkey yeah. speaking. I don't, I don't remember yeah. one way or the other. But it's interesting too. I was watching my husband last night, and there was a certain point where I can't remember what Pan said, and my husband was starting to get annoyed with Pan. And he's like, he's not very supportive, is he? He keeps telling her she's making the wrong decisions and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, uh, totally to me, especially as a child, it's so believable that your demon is the voice of your self-doubt. <laughs> demon is like, wait, we're not strong enough. Wait, this is a terrible idea. Um, that, that made perfect sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's like that little angel on your shoulder in a cartoon, you know, like in a Warner Brothers cartoon or something, you know? Yeah. Except it's not always an angel. I mean, sometimes it's just self-doubt. Um, which, which makes perfect sense. Like, I don't think that I, I never got the impression that, um, even the children's demons were always right. You know, there are moments when, when Pan encourages her not to go forward where she needs to go forward right, to do the right thing. So it's not, you know, that, that, that Pan is, is the angel or the devil. He's just that, he's just that inner voice that's always questioning your decisions and, um, yeah. You're grateful the voice is there, yeah. but that doesn't necessarily mean the voice is always right or incorrect. Yeah. And it would be really interesting, I mean, to, to explore that a little bit more. And it doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't really happen in the books, but, you know, we all know that sometimes that inner voice, um, especially if you're not entirely well, sometimes that inner voice is actually, um, you know, quite detrimental. It would be interesting to sort of see what that looks like. But anyway. Yeah. All right. So we're pretty much out of time. So I think we're going to have to go to some final thoughts here. So, uh, Sam, you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I loved it. I thought it was, I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was a great adaptation. Um, I have problems with it. There's, there's many things that I didn't love, most of which felt more like budgetary or, or sort of like concerns in that had to do with the difficulty of telling a super grand story within the confines of a, of a, of a budget and a, you know, time slot. Um, but that overall, I thought, you know, there was, there were, you know, there was very little that made me be like, you know, oh, this is, this is a huge mistake they've made. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of things, <clears throat> not going to name any names, like top of the box office, current, <laughs> um, uh, movies. I feel like there's a lot of things that spend a ton of money on everything but writing. Um, <laughs> and, and this spent yeah. a lot of money on the writing. Um, and that, and it really showed and really makes this a really special thing. Sarah, final thought? Um, not just that it's stunning. I, I have so so little that, that bothered me about it. I'm, I'm just incredibly happy that we have this, you know, and that it's finally at a place in society where people are ready to hear it. And Aaron, final thought? Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was um, an extremely faithful adaptation of one of my favorite book series. I think if you liked the books, you, you will like the show. Um, if you haven't read the books, um, then I, I don't really know because I do think there are some parts of it that maybe it will be a little bit confusing or slow if you haven't read the books and you don't understand their significance. Um, 
all of which to say, I mean, nothing is ever perfect, but I, I think that this was a really um, creditable adaptation. And I think they got the right team involved in the writing that really clearly loved and understood the property and wanted to do justice to the theme. And they got a production, you know, a studio production that um, gave them the freedom to do what they needed to do with it. Yeah, I, I think it's really good. And I think it gets better and better as it goes. So if it doesn't grab you right off the bat, I would stick with it because, you know, it just, it just gets better and better. I think Mrs. Coulter's performance is, you know, you have to watch it for, for that alone. Um, and I'm really happy that they've already filmed uh, season two because uh, I was, as I said, I was very put out when they, uh, we never got a, a follow up to the 2007 movie. And now nothing can go wrong. As far as I'm concerned. <laughs> We're definitely getting it. And I'm really looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing where the story goes from here. <laughs> Um, so I think we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Aaron Lindsay, Sarah Lynn Mishner, and Sam J. Miller. So thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. It's always wonderful. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Aaron Lindsay, Sarah Lynn Mishner, and Sam J. Miller for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.